Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's uh, panel discussion, Who is Our Neighbor? Immigration Justice and Christian Hospitality. Um, so first I'd like to introduce our four panelists. Uh, Martha Dreyer is a graduate of Northwestern College and earned her MA from the University of South Dakota. She currently works at the Northwest Area Education Agency as an early childhood special education teacher. She was born in Mexico and raised in Sioux County. She's a board member of CASA and uh, also founder of Peace. Uh, Father Doug Klein is pastor of Christ the King Catholic Church in Sioux Center and St. Mary in Rock Valley. He's been a priest for 22 years, 15 of which have been spent here in Sioux, uh, Sioux County. He received his BA in sociology from Creighton University and completed his graduate degree from the Catholic University at Louvain in Belgium. Amanda Behena is an immigration attorney based here in Sioux County. She earned her BA at Iowa State University and her JD from the University of Iowa. And lastly, our first Monday speaker, Gabriel Salguero, who many of you heard uh, speak this morning at 11, is the president and founder of the National Latino Evangelical Coalition. He served on the White House Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships Advisory Council and the board of the National Association of Evangelicals. He and his wife are both pastors at Calvario City Church, a Latino-led Assemblies of God Multicultural Church of about 4,000 people in Orlando, Florida. So we're gonna have a conversation here in three parts. The first uh, part will be uh, each of the panelists will have a, a chance to kind of give an opening statement about their engagement with or their personal history issues uh, surrounding immigration and Christian hospitality. Then we'll have a conversation among the panelists and then we'll keep about a half hour at the tail end for an open-ended Q&A. So feel free to be thinking about questions as the conversation starts. So I'll turn it over first to Reverend Salguero. Thank you. So glad to see a lot of you again and glad to be here during the first Monday speaker series and thank you, Right Reverend, for this invitation and the Honored I met the panelists earlier today and honored to be on this panel with you, so thank you. I think that for me, I'm going to approach the entry point or entry point into this conversation as a pastor. And so the theme of today's panel is who is my neighbor? That question is in the Bible. It is when a young uh, lawyer asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the commandments, you know the rules love your neighbor as yourself, and the young lawyer says to, to Jesus, but who is my neighbor? Jesus never directly responds to the question. He doesn't say, you know, Bob on the corner of, you know, Canal and Delancey. Jesus answers the question by the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus answers the question of who is my neighbor by the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then he answers and says, you go and do likewise. That's how he responds to him. And so I am a pastor, as you heard, of a, a multi-ethnic church in Orlando, Florida, and I'm also the president and founder, together with my wife, Jeanette, of the National Latino Evangelical Coalition. And my entry point is, as a pastor and as an evangelical Christian, and public policy. And so the question I often lead with in this conversation is, what does the gospel have to say about immigration and immigration policy, if anything? What are the principles and the ethics that the gospel informs and, and scripture informs about immigration? And so, as you all know, or you may well know, that the Bible doesn't give policy prescriptions. I wish it did, it would be much easier. But it gives you principles and virtues and, 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 and foundational values to which and from which uh, you can speak. And so, the lead question I always ask as a Christian is not what is the law. My lead question is not what is the law. My lead question is, is the law good? Is it a good law? And how does it impact people's lives? And so as you all know, there are good laws and there are bad laws. And as a Christian, my, my, my public engagement is to support good laws and to make bad laws better. When it comes to immigration, we've been working on it for well over a decade. There are some fundamental uh, brokenness in immigration law in the United States, not just in the United States. Europe has its challenges, Latin America has its challenges, but I live in the United States. So as a Christian citizen, I ask myself, is this the best we can do when it comes to immigration? Or can we advocate, not 
for breaking the law, but to improve the law so that it doesn't break people's lives and families together. Bishop Thomas Wensky, who's a bishop in Florida, Catholic bishop, taught me this term, and the term is this, and I'll close with this, when it comes to morality and law. Never assume that because something is legal, it, it is moral. The term is legal positivism. And so when, as a pastor, if somebody says, but Pastor Salguero or Dr. Salguero, but it's the law of the land, my follow-up question is, is it a moral law? For a long time, slavery was the law of the land. It was a bad law. For a long time, women couldn't vote. There was no women's suffrage. It was the law. It was a bad law. For a long time, segregation was the law in South Africa. Bad law. Apartheid, it's called. And so the question for Christian citizen is, when you look at the law, is it moral and is it good? If it is not, what do you do? How do you respond? How do you change the law and how do you advocate? And that's been the answer, the answer point for the last dozen or so years on, on immigration, and I'm, I'm looking forward to having a, a, a conversation on this. Thank you. <laughs> I wish somebody had asked me that when I was growing up. Is the law good? I wish we had had more conversations as such. Mm -hmm. Instead, I grew up hearing two very conflicting things. I grew up hearing immigrants. I, heard up he I was raised hearing undocumented, illegals, wetback. All terms that described me, all terms that the people around me didn't know that I was classified under. I also grew up in fear, in fear of the law, in fear of releasing the mask that I had hiding who I really was. Um, a little bit of the background story. Uh, my parents immigrated to the United States when I was three and I grew up here without anybody really knowing about my status, nobody really asking me, just assuming that I had legal documentation. I didn't really know about my status until I was 14 and I was eligible, age eligible to um, go through driver's ed and get a driver's permit. And that was the time when I had to start asking some really difficult questions. And I didn't like the answers. And I remember asking my parents over and over, well, why can't we just go get a driver's license? Well, why can't I just go get um, whatever it was? Um, why can't we just go apply for a credit card or apply for whatever it was? Um, and the answer was always the same. It was vague, and there was a lot of questions that were left unanswered. I grew up. Um, in this area, and later when I was um, in, co in college and, and I was looking towards going to college, I realized the challenges that faced um, being undocumented. Um, and at that time, DACA did not exist. So I had to knock on doors and, and seek out opportunities and make ways. And um, if one word would describe my life was the word you used earlier, resiliency and just keep knocking and asking and trying to find a way to fulfill goals and dreams that were tougher than most people realized for them. Um, when I got married to my husband, uh, when I was a junior at Northwestern, um, we applied for residency for myself, which will eventually lead to citizenship. And my good friend Amanda can fill in the legal gaps, but essentially, um, I, was a, I was supposed to be eligible for a waiver since I had overstayed my stay in the United States. Um, but when I went to the U.S. consulate, being married to a U.S. A citizen for a year, um, I was denied the application. And I was also denied the waiver. And I was given the heaviest penalty I could get, which was a 10-year bar. 
So at that time, I had been married for a year. I was in my senior year at Northwestern. It was in March, a couple of months before I was to graduate. Um, and it was devastating, and I felt hopeless. And it was a very, very trying time for my faith, for my family. Um, and I had a decision to make, facing 10 years in Mexico or coming back without permission. So I was in Mexico for 13 years, trying to find a way to make it legal. 13 months. 13 months. Did I say years? I'm sorry. 13 <laughs> months. Not 13 years. 13 months. Thanks, Mano. <laughs> yeah. How old are you? <laughs> Looking good. <laughs> and um, there was no way. And I will never forget something that my lawyer said as I was wrestling with the questions of what is right and what I believe in and what my Christian faith says and trying to reconcile this brokenness. And my lawyer finally said, you know, Martha, I can't counsel you anymore as to what decision you have to make. But sometimes God laws and man laws just do not jive, and you need to make a decision. So I came back, and um, a year later, President Obama issued an executive action called DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and I applied for it in hope and in faith that I wouldn't get sent back because I wasn't supposed to be here, and here I am. And so just that still baffles me as to how how that all went, and I just took a leap of faith, and here we are. Amanda? <laughs> also baffles me. <laughs> yeah. um, not, I wasn't uh, Martha's lawyer, but I always really appreciate hearing her story and um, helps me realize being her friend what a lot of my clients are dealing with in their homes. They may come to meet with me and take notes and think about things and ask questions, but there's definitely a life behind all the people that I represent and having friends like Martha um, really brings that home. So I had a bit of a winding road to become an immigration lawyer, basically knew Spanish and was a lawyer. So uh, when I moved back here, <laughs> it became so. <laughs> so um, I am from Sioux Center and um, I live here with my husband, Carlos, who is from um, Mexico. So even befo long before I was an immigration lawyer, we had some then very friendly people at the Immigration and Nationality Service, I think, or maybe it was USCIS at the time, um, guide us on which forms to fill out and when. And now that I'm an immigration lawyer, I'm like, even their advice was wrong. <laughs> there was a faster, better way to do this. But anyway, so... Um, it is a very complicated process. Uh, we weren't guided correctly in easier times by the officials themselves, I learned, although it went very smoothly. And, and um, we, we uh, fortunately met in Mexico and were able to do all the steps to be able to um, get through that process. But even then, was it was very um, stressful at times. It was a lot of money for a young couple just starting out, and I don't know if at the time, because it went smoothly, it hit home how important it was, but sometimes I think back now how fortunate we were that our road was smooth. Um, now raising three spunky, half Latino, half Dutch children in Sioux Center, Iowa, so seeing people talk about Latinos and culture and Dutch and what does this mean is very important to me from that aspect as well, because we're my daughter's eight, so we're just starting to get some of those questions and conversations in school, but thankfully for us, it's been very positive, and maybe because they know who we are, but um, so that's been good part of the, we've had a good experience with that in our community. Um, immigration law, very, very complicated. My job did not exist probably before 1986 so much. Um, a very strict law was passed in 1986 as part of a larger movement um, uh, to l define what is legal immigration and create laws, um, mostly regulatory laws, say, defining how people can come in and who can come in and putting quotas on different countries and what countries do we want people co to come in from and what countries do we want to limit. Um, all those conversations happened actually um, probably too quickly, uh, a law was passed, a very 
nonsensical law in 1986, almost overnight, when people didn't realize when you make all these rules and quotas by country and by family and by type of family member, what the long-term Im implications of that um, is. We are still living with that law today. The public didn't have a lot of input on it. I have a feeling immigrants didn't have any input on it. It wasn't meant to be necessarily as harsh as it is, but the quotas have not really increased to fit the need that we have today. And um, a lot of things that were written in there didn't take into account how immigration had been working and migration had been working up to that point. Um, does anybody listen to the podcast, Re is it Revisionist History? Um, highly, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot from it. The, um, the podcast from Revisionist History, which is free, on how we got to where we are today on immigration law. And he puts it in a very, um, very understandable context. And I was very surprised. And it gave me a lot of context to um, find that the person who basically, um, someone came back from, who's seen it? it? Was it the Vietnam War? I think um, the individual who was in charge, and don't quote me on this, but I know he was in charge of militarizing a border in, um, outside of the United States in a war zone. He came back and was assigned to basically militarize the U.S.-Mexican border. And it's been flowing from there. So back in the day, people would come and go, and there was a lot of seasonal migration, kind of under the radar, but not so much because people would come, work where needed, and leave. Now, there's political things there, too, with labor unions, and they were getting, you know, there's, you know, maybe not the ideal situation for everyone. But then basically what they said was, we're done with that, and we're going to put quotas. So now these people who are coming, working, and leaving would come, and they couldn't leave because they knew they couldn't come back. So that's a part of the reason of how we got to where we were today. People were doing what they were always doing, but then suddenly they knew if they left, I can't come back next year and work. And that's how my family, my grandparents even supported this family, and it's been generations that we've been doing this. Um, so, hence my job was born. <laughs> lots of rules, lots of regulations not fitting what, how immigration was working in the past. I don't know if that was intentional or if people just thought it's probably time to have some rules here. Um, every year when we talk about um, immigration reform, some people see that as a, we're going to make it more sensical for immigrants. Others see it as, we're going to vet people even further. So we're seeing especially vulnerable populations being sorted out for additional vetting. Uh, we're seeing um, just now they're working on a um, new regulations to keep certain immigrants who've had to depend on public benefits from adjusting, which has freaked everyone out in this community because even if they have US citizens who are on like Hawkeye, <laughs> They are wanting, their, these immigrants are like, this may bar me from forever, you know, be getting citizenship. Or maybe I'm on the road to permanent residency, but now my, my two-year-old has always been on Medicaid. Maybe I should take her off and just run the risk um, because of long-term things. So um, under Obama, there, we've never been able to, <laughs> and I can, only under, I can only imagine the frustration uh, Gabe, that, that you must have had working towards positive immigration reform, sensical immigration reform, and we almost got there and we didn't get there, but um, we've never been able to really pass anything comprehensive. So under each administration, there's policies or proclamations trying to make things easier, but nothing's permanent. So everything is just more uncertain and more complicated. So now you can't just read the law. You have to know how this proclamation or this regulation changed. So my book on the law is this big. <laughs> the regulations are each this big, plus I have to print out everything that comes in the federal registrar and have several guiding books because case law also affects how each term is defined, which is part of law, but this is supposed to be people being able to ask for their parents from you know, Mexico by filling out some forms. The forms are three times longer this year than they were three years ago, uh, the, the fees have increased, and all of it is kind of right now 
Um, we, we call it the double D. Um, this, the, it, this administration's policy is literally discourage, delay, deny. So what we're doing is delay, delay, delay till hopefully we get another administration and all of you will just live in limbo if it's an uncertain application. If it's a certain application, let's go for it. But if we're not sure, delay, delay, delay. We also have, I have many clients who are um, separated by their family by the travel ban. Um, so right now, I mean, I don't want to be gloom and doom and gloom, but what immigrants go through in their daily lives is directly affected by who's in office and the politics and who's making these decisions and how loud the voters are talking about what they want to see. So if voters sit quietly and let things happen and say, oh, it's just a regulation, it's one after another after another making immigrants' lives right now very stressful. Legal immigrants, too. Because now it's, can I be on this benefit? Or are they going to change this policy? Or, oh, my wife from India could work, but no, they changed a benefit and she can't work. So now we're on one income. So, um, yeah, it's a fascinating job, an interesting job, but um, I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir by the people who've come to this group. So I would just encourage people to get involved in politics. If you're seeing things, Policies like actively trying to discourage a group of people from immigrating here because of where they're from or the color of their skin while encouraging another group because they're Europeans uh, to speak up about those kind of things because it really does affect people. And reach out to immigrants that you know to just be like, hey, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> you know, maybe it seems like it's tough right now, but it's nice, I think, to be able to tell people we appreciate you being here and making our community a more exciting place so anyway long talk but I am an immigration lawyer under the Trump administration so <laughs> I'm just kind of giving a, a local perspective kind of has uh, seen this immigration issue over the last number of years because I'm a native of Sioux County so growing up over in Hospers back then when we talked about diversity it was whether you went to Baldwin Catholic or Unity Christian or the public school, and we had up, you know, trying to break down barriers between, you know, the European immigrant groups. Um, my my own experience with immigration, my, you know, I have a great grandfather who came from Luxembourg, but otherwise I grew up here. So my dip, my perspective when I, you know, when I'm working with those who in the, in the experience now, um, like Martha, it's like it's so different, you know. When I travel, and I, I, you know, if I'm in another country where I don't know the language, you know, and my passport is always there with me, and I'm not sure what's going to go on, I just can't imagine, you know, not having that security um, for the people that are here in that situation. I came back to Sioux County in 2003. Been here now for 15 years. So, in that time, I've been able to kind of witness how this immigration issue has. Um, really affected and, as, as you know, has changed the face of Sioux County, literally, in many ways. You know, in 2003, when I first got here, um, having been a native here, I thought, well, I wonder how people are welcoming, you know, these Hispanics moving into Sioux County, you know, in Sioux Center, where from, and I was amazed because it was, people were kind of excited. Then as the wave began to become more, I mean, from 2003, I think, to 2000. 10 was where we had a lot of increase over you know, overnight. And then I also noticed that the, the talk on the national level became so negative. And it began to say, oh, you know, illegal, breaking the law. And I started to hear people, good people here in Sioux County saying, well, I don't know. I like, you know, I know, you know, they're hard workers, but I don't think people should break the law. And and there was a lot of issues at that time, and I became more involved because when I first came, they were just members of my church that came there. They didn't, we don't care about what their legal status is. But then I began to hear stories of, you know, a member from my church who was stopped for speeding and didn't have a license and ended up in the jail and is being deported, leaving behind a wife and children. And all of a sudden, here, 
just raised within within the immigrant community in Sioux County. I'm looking at Judy because about was that 2009 we had the task force somewhere around there, 2008. But the good people of Sioux County said, well, we need to talk about this. There's people, you know, living in such fear. So we formed a task force of community members. We had representatives from law enforcement, from healthcare, from education, um, clergy, um, Southwest Iowa Tech, um, um, businesses, uh, dairy farmers. And through the course of that summer, we met about nine different times and just went through each of those issues. Did we come up with all the answers? No. <laughs> but we came up with a lot more understanding. And one thing, there were a few things we agreed on. The immigration system is broken. And we talked about, you know, there's a law, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's moral. But also sometimes I think, you know, we expect immigrants to who come. Why did they come? Because of our generosity? Sometimes, but most often, we need them. We need workers. I remember way back in the 80s seeing a sign about immigration and it said, on one side it said, help wanted, and you see the immigrant crossing into the US. And then they flip it around the other side, it says, no trespassing. Yeah, law and you know we, we have responsibilities, but when we, but we also have rights. And so often I'm frustrated to see, you know, immigrants were saying, okay, they're not following all the laws. Well, many of them are following more of the laws than <laughs> some of us, but yet we give them no rights. Moving then to maybe just my experience as a pastor, and pastoring both of my churches are actually majority immigrant-based, mostly Hispanic, Mexi coming from Mexico, Guatemala. And so I see the toll it takes on families, and I see the toll it takes on our church community because they're, they're good people and they want to be involved, but they hold back, especially from leadership, because they're afraid. <laughs> they don't want to be up front. Because it's not maybe only I'm afraid of there, because if someone gets mad at me, they might make a phone call because they know my status, and then my family's life is changed. And of course, as we all, you know, I think with the young people, with Martha, you know, you know, I can see the difference. You know, here's a young Hispanic who was born here, and all the doors are open. And here's a young Hispanic who's been here, knows no other country, but, you know, should I go to college? <laughs> should I pay for college? If I, if I get a college degree, I, you know, what kind of job can I get? Still maybe at a, you know, in the agriculture, so why go to college? And so that's, you know, it really is about green right there. So, you know, who is my neighbor? I think it goes back and again, and what I've always noticed is what we need to do especially if you're an advocate for immigrants, is know your neighbors and help others to know them. Because I've seen it happen when people say, when they talk about them, oh, those illegal immigrants are undocumented, them, as opposed to, oh, but Jose's my neighbor and his kids are so cute and they come over and play with my kids. Then it becomes someone. It becomes a real person. And when we're dealing with real people, hopefully that our laws will be reflected and be more just and more humane. Thank you. So, I mean, one theme that seemed to kind of run throughout all of your responses was the difference between something that is lawful and something that is moral. And there's a sense that our identity as Christians in some senses ought to impact what we, how we should respond to laws, how we should determine their relative justice or injustice. So I'm wondering from a pastoral perspective or from a personal perspective or from a legal perspective, how would you encourage Christians to think about their, the right response to unjust laws? What are the proper responses? And how can we be just to our neighbors as we face a system which seems to be set against our neighbors in many ways? That's a, that's a great question. I, I think that you know, n knowledge is power. And we have to be informed and what the law is, and its impact on uh, what Father Doug said, which is 
humanize it? What is the human toll of whatever law it is? In this case, we're talking about uh, immigration reform. I do stuff around criminal justice. I do stuff around life and imprisonment. And, and I, my question as a, as a Christian who, you know, St. Augustine, city of God, city of, of humanity, or city of man, is that I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, but I'm also a citizen of a specific country. And as a Christian citizen, I have to ask, what is the toll of this law on people? You know, um, Amanda was talking about the last real reform was in 1986 uh, under, the Reagan uh, 80, under the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. There have been executive orders and other things, but the real major overhaul was 1986 under, under the Reagan administration. Um, I remember I worked with uh, George W. Bush, and there were bipartisan support for immigration reform, and under Obama, and, and I worked with Republicans and Democrats and independents. And when I came to the table as a Christian, I said, what, what is the impact of this law on people and our society? And does it reflect our deepest moral convictions and our, and our highest interests? What does it mean that a child who was brought here at two years of age or three years of age or six months of age and, and needs, you're going to deport him or her? And they don't even maybe speak the language of the country that they came from, be it in Asia, be it in Latin America, be it in, on the continent of Africa. What does it mean that we have quotas? Why are some immigrants more acceptable than other immigrants? I live in Florida, so why, why if you're Cuban and you, you, your feet step on Florida, you're given automatically access. But if you're Haitian and you step in Florida, you're not. Why is that? Is that moral? Is that just? Is that equitable? It's a lot of work. And so my, my question, you know, I'm a pastor, and so I baptize people, and I marry people, and I don't ask people, hey, where were you born? To give them the body and the blood of Christ. You know, the communion doesn't have a, 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 a borders test. Um, neither does baptism, for that matter. And so as, as a Christian who is a responsible citizen, I must ask, what is the good of this law? And what is the direct impact, especially on vulnerable people, on families, on, 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 on children, on, on the elderly? And, and so if we're not asking that question, then, you know, what, what does inform our position on policy? And then once we are informed, what are we advocating for in its place? So it's not good enough to say this law is no good or this law is great. You know, you have to know what would you like to see in its place? What are the possible alternatives? What would improve this law? So we're in the 21st century with 20th century immigration law. Why do we allow that? And why has the, the cultural tonality changed around that? You know, in scripture, in the book of Genesis, there's a famous question that actually comes from not the, the best character in the garden. Who has taught you this? And you're wondering what character is the serpent. But, uh, <laughs> you know, why do we advocate for laws? What, what's our rationale behind it? What is our moral grounding? What is our biblical grounding? What is our, what is our primary commitment that we say yes to this or no to this? And, and if we don't ask the why question, not just the what is the law, the why that law exists, and the how question, how it impacts Martha and, and, and people like Martha, you know, I, I flew to Las, Vegas, to Las Vegas when DACA was announced. It, it was amazing to see how the families responded. I was in that, it was in a high school, um, and I flew there with the president at the time, and I remember the mom and her child crying and saying, thank you, now I can go to college, and, and some of them went for military service, and others went to other places. That makes a difference. When you ask the why question, when you're not just making you know, assumptions, but you're really digging into it, as a Christian, forget it, uh, not as a, anything else, as a Christian, I have to ask the why question and the how it impacts other people. Because my primary allegiance is to the gospel of Jesus Christ above everything. And so that allegiance informs how I speak to policy. And there are policies that hurt people, and I should advocate against them. And there are policies that help people, and I should advocate for them. said the first time I had to share my story well the first time I shared my story I didn't have to um, was when I was a youth group leader at our church 
and I was terrified. Um, nobody else ha that I knew had shared their story so publicly. In fact, we didn't even talk about it with each other. Um, and the first time I shared it, the reasons why was because I had the opportunity to shape young minds and to be able to advocate for something that there was very little known about on that perspective. I mean, yes, we heard the news and we heard all of the negative terminology and, and we heard all of the breaking the laws and the illegals, but they had never heard a real live person who they knew share their story and share how difficult it was to obtain status. They had never heard a personal story on why people can't just become legal, why people were here illegally yet. And after that, and he hearing the response from these young students, um, you high schoolers are terrifying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just incredible to receive that feedback mm -hmm. um, and to have them open up and just to finally ask questions and to finally wonder well, what can we do? What can be done? And even today, my story isn't finished yet. My tenure bar is up next um, March, this coming March 2019. And I have a long ways to go yet, and our laws are still broken. And I still have no pathway to citizenship at this time, even though I'm married to a US citizen. So asking questions and hearing stories and really understanding that each and every case is unique and individual, and that the laws that we have aren't helping individuals who are here, have been here, and who just want a chance at having a say, at not having to fear what tomorrow brings. I have three young kids at home, and I still have to fear being separated from them, being taken away. And how do you share that with a seven, four, and a 16-month-old? You know, you can't. So we pray, and we hope, and I share. And I shared, and I hope that somebody will listen, and then the more people we have advocating and hearing and sharing other stories, that something can change. You know, the morality issue there is also, I think, with this humane law. Mm -hmm. But also, members, sometimes we think that, okay, this is the law and I have to follow it, but we meant who made the law? Mm. We make the laws and the laws change all the time. Mm -hmm. And we have the ability to change the law. And the vast majority of people I know, <laughs> they're similar to Mark, they, they would do anything <laughs> if given a way forward. And I think sometimes, yeah, we don't understand it. If you ever want to <laughs> Do an internship there with <laughs> Amanda and see the paperwork and the <laughs> amount of oh, mm -hmm. the work that goes into it. You know, it's, it's amazing. Um, you know, I think sometimes when you look at it, just the, the things that are set out there, it seems like, well, why don't they just do it legally? Mm -hmm. Or stand in this <laughs> mythical line that doesn't mm -hmm. exist. But we can change the law. And it's not saying, that, okay, we're, you know, we're still going to have the law, we want it to be better, we want it to be more humane. And and yes, no one's talking about opening the borders because we're also a nation. And the, the good things that allows us to be a place that people want to come to are guided by our laws. And so I think you know, that is a good question. What is the humane thing? Uh, protect our borders, but let's have humane ways for those people who have the opportunity and can come and want to be and can contribute to our society can be here. So, I mean, one thing following up on that response, one question that kind of came to mind listening to you all talk is, it seems there's a lot of misconceptions, popular misconceptions surrounding immigration, probably on both sides of the political spectrum. Are there particular myths that you would like to disabuse us of <laughs> from personal experience, from legal experience, <laughs> et cetera? Things you'd like to kind of clear up. It's a long list, brother. Yeah, <laughs> it's a long <laughs> list. I love the one. Why don't they just get in line? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I I have, I have consults all the time, and I call it the bad the bad news discount because between us, it's usually a free consult because 
probably 50% of the time I can't do anything mm -hmm. for someone who's here. And the worst part is I have to get to the bottom of why they came here. And nobody comes here undocumented these days with everything that's going on the border. I mean, there are organ traffickers on the border. It is extremely dangerous to cross the border. You do not cross the border unless there is something, you are like a refugee. So I had someone in today where she goes, well, I was a single mom with my kids in Chiapas, Mexico. I just didn't have a way to work. I'm like, yeah, I get that, but what happened to you? Something happened to you. You wouldn't come here with your children if there wasn't something else. And she's like, oh, well, you know, it's just hard as a single mom. And I said, yes, but did something happen to you? Because coming here is huge with your children. And knowing that you'll probably be detained at the border or risking the cartels are basically controlling it. Um, and then, you know, no, it's just, you know, I just had to, it, it was hard for me there. And I'm like, yes, but what happened? And it took half an hour to get her real story about why she was terrified at home and what she couldn't do. But this is, if you're, if someone has come in the last two years, three years, it is because there is something terrifying at home. Like their life is truly at risk if they came undocumented. The worst part is then she told me her story. She shared it, which was very difficult. And I still had to say, well, you get the bad news discount. I can't do anything for you. There's nothing. You don't qualify for asylum for that type of a problem. I know that your life is at risk, but it's not the kind of problem that's going to get you asylum. And you have no family here with papers, so you can't do that. Um, you came here unlawfully, so no, no employer can ever sponsor you, even if they wanted to help. They can't. So unless someone beats you up in the street, you tell immigration, maybe then come back and talk to me. Um, but other than that, you're, you're sunk. So there's no line, um, especially for people who are coming here recently. They changed, it used to be that a domestic violence survivor or, um, from Guatemala could get asylum, but that got changed by uh, regulation recently saying, no, we're not going to give asylum to domestic violence survivors anymore unless Basically, the police were beating her up or something like that. So um, things like that where get in line, you should do it legally. First of all, right now, they're not coming here unless they're essentially a refugee, but then they've closed off those options for them as well for 90% of the claims we used to make for asylum. So um, no line if you don't have family with citizenship or if there's an employer like sponsoring you while you're still in lawful status so or you get abused and report to the police, but nobody wants, wishes that on someone, so. I, I, the myth of many, uh, you know, Jesus said <coughs> in John 8, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. So here's, the number one is there's no lie. There's no lie because of what Amanda said, the regulations and so forth. Number two is why are certain immigrants more valuable than others? especially STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Why are they more valuable than a young woman who's fleeing La Mara Salvatrucha in Honduras or El Salvador or Nicaragua? Why? Is that a good law? I don't know. I do know. Uh, <laughs> the cost. Cost. The fourth myth. Immigrants are, are um, leeching off our economic future. Undocumented immigrants could not benefit from the social safety net. But many of them, over, over two thirds, over 67%, give into the social security system, which they cannot benefit from. Mm -hmm. And so they're helping a lot of elderly people who are citizens, sustaining it. Um, if we change the immigration law, it's over a billion dollar boom to the US economy. So we can make the moral argument, we could make the economic argument, we could make the family argument, we could make the political argument, and still people don't. What's going on? Why if it's an economic boom, it's a moral boom, it's, it's, a, it's a relational boom, still people don't want it? Are we ready to answer that question? Do we want to look in the mirror and say, ¿Qué es lo que está pasando? 
Eh, déjame darle un, un receso a mi intérprete en estos momentos. ¿sabes? ¿Qué rayo está pasando? Si todos los factores apuntan a una mejoría por la reforma inmigratoria, ¿por qué no lo queremos? If every factor points to a benefit to immigration reform, why do we still not want it? If the economic argument is in favor of immigration reform, if the moral argument is in favor of immigration reform, if every religious tradition, Catholic, evangelical, Jews, Muslims, all want it, where is this resistance coming from? Just ask that question. What's going on? If it's going to benefit agriculture, if it's going to benefit you know, the Dole Company in Florida and the Del Monte, everything it says, hey, now good people can disagree on the how. Good and well-intentioned people can disagree on the how, and that's right and appropriate to discuss. But if all the arguments are for it, where's the resistance coming from? Riddle me this, Batman. If it is a benefit and it speaks to the highest angels of our spirit, to quote President Abraham Lincoln, if overwhelmingly two-thirds of the American electorate want it, Republican, Democrat, and Independent, why is there a lack of the political will? If everybody from the Pope to the National Association of Evangelicals to the Reformed Jewish tradition, to the Muslim clerics, to uh, AJC, American Jewish, everybody wants it. Where's the resistance? Could it be that the myths are so powerful and feed our fear so deeply that we're afraid what might happen if we change? I don't know. What do I do know? So we'd like at this point to turn it uh, over to you all and to open it up for Q&A um, from the audience. If you want to direct your question to one of the panelists, that's fine, or to the group as a whole. I just ask that you would, uh, when you do have a question and we call on you, if you would stand up and then uh, state your name and then uh, speak loudly so that uh, the whole group can hear. Great question. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that it comes from Arizona. <laughs> Arizona, la zona aria. Um, I'll give you a small list. I think that Juno should have a, a pathway to citizenship. I think that the unification of families should be a factor in immigration status. It's, fa it's a fascinating thing how language distorts the policies we ask for. If I said to you family unification as a moral value, everybody would say, well, that's a great idea, Martha, Amanda, Father Doug. Family, we, we are evangelicals, I am. Evangelicals believe for family values. I can make that same statement and make it something else, chain migration. I'm speaking about the same thing, but I'm redefining how it's seen. You're either a chain or a family. You're a child citizen or an anchor baby. I'm talking about the same thing. <laughs> you see how language is powerful? I'm beginning with the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Family unification. Pathway to citizenship. Uh, I think that we need to talk about how employers are viewed and the abuse of employers. It's a fascinating thing that people who work illegally are called illegal, but the employers that hire them illegal are not called illegal. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that we need to talk about how we deal with employers. I think that, it, I think that, we, that, that we need to talk about um, how long the waiting list is. 
I think we need to talk about why quarters from Africa are different than Europe. We need to revisit that. I think that we need to deal with people's real concerns about safety and border security. These are not illegitimate concerns. I think we need to face that straight on, especially if people have been victimized. I'm okay with that. Let's have the honest conversation. But let's do the math. Let's do the math. Let's make it an honest conversation. And so, path to citizenship, family unification. I think there needs to be a way for the millions of people who are here and law-abiding citizens. We have to create a metric for people to get in line and that they're not in limbo for eternity and living in the shadows. I have a longer list, but those are three things right off the top of my head. Definitely, um, especially for those individuals who are here yeah. who they will never have any pathway to citizenship, mm -hmm. such as a family that I know who have a permanent bar. I mean, have been here their whole lives, mm -hmm. law-abiding citizens, mm -hmm. and they have permanent bar, and they'll never be able to obtain status because at one point in their life, they crossed illegally without any documentation, it was recorded, mm -hmm. and now there's, there's mm -hmm. nothing, yeah. there's no pardon. About that? that was my change. The permanent bar, the 10-year bar, and the three-year bar would be my changes. Um, if I had to pick, you know, if I can't overhaul the whole system, which would be awesome. <laughs> kind yes, of a practically-minded person, and I could just rewrite that whole thing from the immigration courts on. But anyway, um, if we ha could make one change, I would get rid of the permanent bar, the 10-year bar, the three-year bar for different punishments for um, entering unlawfully and staying amount, a certain amount of time, or the permanent bar is for someone who, say, entered on a visa or unlawfully, was here for a year or more, left um, for whatever reason to, you know, visit their dying mother or something and re-entered unlawfully, even if they weren't caught. They are barred forever. Does not matter who petitions them. Forever, ever done. Um, the 10-year bar is for anyone who's been here unlawfully a year or more, um, it's a problem, especially for parents of U.S. citizens. Their children will never be able to petition them because if they entered on, if the parents entered unlawfully, because um, they have to go back to their home country to adjust in most cases for an interview. And when they go there, the ten-year bar hits, and their parent, their children cannot get them a waiver for that bar. So um, the myth of having U.S. citizen, oh, they have U.S. citizen children and then they can stay, anchor babies, blah, blah, blah. If they came in unlawfully, forget it unless you're, they can spend 10 years in Mexico, you know, which some people do. Um, if we got rid of the 310 and permanent bar and came up with some other punishment for crossing the border unlawfully, say a fine, or even I know people would do jail time, um, employers could petition people. Uh, good workers who are here right now. We don't have to bring in more immigrants to replace the immigrants who are already here and established. So the reason employers can't petition workers here now is because of the 310 and permanent bar. So I have employers call me all the time to say, I would love to petition so-and-so. I know he's not legal, but he's worked for me for 15 years. He's like family. He's got kids. And I said, that's a nice sentiment, and I appreciate hearing that, but we can't do anything for him. Um, if he gets detained, maybe you can write him a support letter, but you probably don't want to because then you're going to get in trouble yourself. So, um, so yeah, that would be my, my first change. <laughs> and also the decision for that is pretty arbitrary. Yeah. So having, you know, if it, that's going to stay, then how are we going to make the decision as to who's going to receive that 10-year bar? One other, one other area that I would mention would you know, reasonable work program that gives uh, protection to workers and just wage, um, you know, even those who want to come in for a certain amount of time, um, is it the HB1 or the labor one? Or the, the so yeah, the so H2, H2, there's just a couple. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they say, well, we want technology people to come in, but we're in Sioux County. We need people to come in and work on dairy farms. Which, there's nothing for that. And there's, there's no visa mm -hmm. to come in and work at a, a, a dairy farm. Green card. And the I other part I is, I, I believe, for me, would be a pathway to citizenship. But if we can't get that, some sort of legal status, if you don't call it residency, you know, for many of these parents, you know, okay, my kids will stay here, but if I can have legal 
a status that allows me to come out of the shadow, to have a legal driver's license, to have insurance on my car, to, to be able to contribute more fully to the society, they would go for that. I, I prefer to see the pathway to citizen to give them full rights, but if we can't reach that, at least give some sort of legal status. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, there's this great organization called CASA. <laughs> My friend Judy and Harold over there, they are the co-leaders of it. It's Center for Assistance, Service, and Advocacy. And uh, there's so many great things happening behind the curtains, um, such as just having conversations with the local law enforcement and knowing their stance on immigration and just informing them as to what's happening, um, having dialogue, very important, building relationships. So that's one. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the PEACE program, which is just getting to know, that that's a volunteer program where um, an individual is paired with a Spanish-speaking student who wants to learn English as an adult ELL learner and building relationships that way, getting to know somebody in the community. One of the titles is Who is My Neighbor? Early when we had a dinner, we were talking about that a little bit, is, you know, even if you're saying, I'm not a political, I'm not getting involved at that level, just get to know the people who live around you. Even if it's just getting knowing the name, or if you have neighbors, just to say, hello, I'm so-and-so, and, you know, we get, we get afraid, because we're like, well, I'm not sure if I know the language or if they know our language. I was at a conference and there were deaf people. We, were, we figured a way to communicate. There's, there's always a way to communicate. Um, and the other part is, is, you know, when you're voting, just look at all the issues, you know, and, and make sure you consider this issue amongst those. And, and you know, that's the only way we can get some changes. Owen, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. It's a good question. I, I think that, just let's talk about DACA for a minute. You know, um, I think that there's a lack of political will. There's just a lack of political will in some, in some circles. I think, I think that um, people are afraid of pushback, of blowback. Um, um, we had something. We, we had something, and it's been overturned. And we were promised a something in its place that would be beautiful and merciful. Um, <laughs> I, I, we were promised that. I, I heard it. It was I, a promise. It was a promise. I was there. Um, on, on, you know, I was there. Um, <laughs> and so the truth is that, look, Every time I've been, I've been to D.C. more times than I can imagine just on this issue. And overwhelmingly, there's bipartisan support. Like, I've met with Republicans and Democrats and independents, and they're like, yeah, this is a good idea, this is a good idea, this is a good idea. I was in D.C. the day the bipartisan Senate bill passed in the Senate. I was there crying and jumping and dancing, and that's something to see. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> didn't pass. <laughs> yeah. And it didn't go to the day, and I spoke to, I was, I'll leave the names out of it, and it didn't come, they refused to vote on it in the House because, because people are afraid that in a primary they may be voted out. They, they, there's fear. Um, and so DACA was for us, who thought on immigration, that was the easiest one. 
it was the easiest lift politically and partisan wise and look where it is now and so and the other thing is that for people who vote immigration I'll talk about evangelicals which is a group I know best is not always the top voting priority it may not be in the top five or the top three and I understand that I'm an evangelical I pastor an evangelical church of 5,000 people of a very diverse I have Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and people who don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> and I have to preach to them. And, and so the reason we can't do it is because it's not a priority. And there's no political will for it. There are a lot of things that have strong bipartisan support in the Senate and the House that will probably happen. There, there's more political will for criminal justice reform, for changing, you know, mandatory. There's a lot of things that can move. But on this issue, people are concerned that if they move just a little bit, and, and I'll say from both directions, from, from both directions, if they give a little bit, uh, they'll get voted out. And that is a lack of courage. Courage is in high demand and low supply. I have a second part of the question. Christian think tanks on this topic. <sighs> There's an organization called Malice. I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> the National Latino Evangelical Coalition. The president's a little suspect, but everyone. <laughs> uh, um, look, I think the National Association of Evangelicals has great stuff on it, and uh, I don't want to be. So I'm on the board, but I don't want to be self-serving. I think the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has amazing theological work on it. I think the Mennonite. Um, they have an immigration committee that is uh, very good. Um, you know, there's just a lot of people who, who approach it from a gospel center. Not from left or right, but from a gospel center. And, and their policy recommendations are deeply grounded in the gospel. And so where, where you go to Catholic bishops, where you go to my Mennonite Central com Committee, uh, whether you go to the NAE, whether you go... Uh, to these evangelical movements. I think the CRC has a, an immigration cohort. Um, there's a lot of good stuff being done, and it's just at a click of a, of a, of a, a mouse um, that you can find out where people who are of the same faith tradition and of, of similar minds are advocating uh, policy positions with a deeply biblical uh, grounding. I, I want to add one thing. There's, there's a political. Uh, I spoke uh, some time ago to, who are these people? The um, Chambers of Commerce, National Chambers of Commerce. I spoke to them, and they, the group that spoke to them on immigration was the Bipartisan Policy Center, and on that board is are people like Condoleezza Rice, and and Jeb Bush and others, and uh, people from from the from the left too. And it was amazing, the recommendations of the Bipartisan Policy Center on immigration, where there are kind of lifelong Democrats and Republicans on it so people can see. And they make the economic, they make the kind of uh, family, they make a whole list of arguments. Um, Grover Norquist is on that thing, advocating for immigration reform, just to give you a sense of the breadth of the conversation. So I, I look at them, too, as a bipartisan. That's not a religious group, but it is a bipartisan group. We have time for maybe one more question. My dream is to finally have a pathway to citizenship. Simply stated, I. I just want to finalize my personal situation just as many other DACA recipients do so we're not just here on a Band-Aid so that we're here permanently, legally, and we get all the same rights as everyone else and not have the fear of whether or not tomorrow it'll still be in effect. My dream is that a young woman named Fabiola, that is her real name, 
Fabiola Angel, who was the babysitter to my children growing up. Came here around four years old, and her two sisters came. I think they were three and two. They have a younger sister who was born in the U.S. to come out of the shadows. She's highly intelligent. She wants to do nursing. And she, because of immigration policies, could not do a lot of things she wanted. And she was the primary child uh, taker, caregiver of my children. My dream is that people would see her and stop calling her them and us and illegal. And that they would change the policy, Fabiola would come out of the shadows with her two sisters and her parents. Her mother could not go see the grandmother when she died. You could not imagine what it is not to bury your mother. My dream is that people humanize this and move it beyond partisanship. And for goodness sakes, let's get it fixed. It is not impossible. It's not even really hard. It takes courage. And my dream is that when I stand up for immigration, that people don't assume things about me and don't call me names. My name is Gabriel. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm your brother. And I do it because I'm a Christian. Gabriel, I'm sorry, Amanda, and Dr. Jacqueline, I thank you so much for taking the time to be here, and I thank you for your courage in speaking out, for your seeking after justice in your various communities, and we thank you so much for testifying to those things here. Gabriel, can I ask you to close us in prayer? Sisters and brothers, familia, let us pray. Dios de Abraham, de Isaac y de Jacob, de Agar, de Sara, de Raquel y de Rebeca, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Sarah, Hagar, Rachel, and Rebecca, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God of the sojourner and the stranger, God of the citizen, teach us to love your kingdom so much that we love each other beyond boundaries, beyond race, beyond ethnicity, beyond age. Teach us that when we pray, our Father, remember that he's the immigrant's Father and the citizen's Father. Teach us to live in justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly before our God. For Dort College and for these panelists, for these students and these faculty and these administrators, for every good gift of courage and temperance and patience and boldness, we give you glory. And send us out from this room as ambassadors of reconciliation, mercy, and justice. And this we pray in the name of the one the ancients called wonderful, counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father, in the matchless name of Jesus. Please join me in thanking our panelists.